Hi, welcome to part three of the XT8088 kit build. And this part is all about the 8088 board. I ordered the PCB separately and then sourced all the parts based on the building materials from the GitHub. Take a look in the description for all the information that you need. So let's get on with building this 8088 PC card. Before we get onto building this last board, let's have a look at the projects that inspired me to make it in the first place. We have the video by LGR where he builds the NUXT PC in the Micro ATX case. And that was based on the designs by Sergei Kizilev. If we go to his website, malinov.com, we can see a list of all of his projects. Now he has many, but we're concentrating on the ISA backplane, the Micro 8088. There is an ISA VGA card based on the Trident, an ISA floppy disk controller, and an OPL2 sound card. If we have a look at the XI, we can see that it is a bigger version of the Micro. This has all of the chips from the 8088 system. If we take a look at the board that I'm building, which is the Micro 8088, it has the Faraday chip, the processor, the ROM, and the RAM. Whereas the XI 8088 has the processor, the RAM, and the ROM. And then it has the chips for DMA controlling and clock generation separately. This board is a lot better in some ways. It's 16-bit and has a lot more control over the clocks generated. I'm going to build the Micro 8088. It's a lot easier to find the parts. There are fewer parts, so it's cheaper to build. If you do look online, you can find some of these boards, and they're mainly in Russia. I decided to download the Gerber files and send them off to JLC PCB. Here we can see the order that I placed. I ordered five boards, altogether £11.83 with two to three week shipping. Since starting this, I've also ordered a CMS Creative Music System card and a floppy controller that are again based on Sergei's designs. Let's get on with actually assembling and we'll cover the details as we come across them. What I've done to organize the parts is to use the spare boards that I have. I've gone through the bill of materials and just put them into the boards. So first we have one with all of the sockets in. I then went through all of the passive components and placed them into a second board. And I organized all of the integrated circuits into some anti-static foam. So my plan is to pick the components out of the boards and just put them into the right place on the one and then solder them up. And like on all the other kits, we start with the smallest, lowest component and work our way up. We have R2 and R3 and they are 47 ohm. R7 is a 10K. R1 is a 33 ohm. R6 is a 1K. R4 and 5 are 470 ohm. R8 is a 1 meg. That is all of the through hole resistors. I'm going to put in a, a 1N148 diode in D1. Next are the resistor packs and we have RR3 and that is a 4.7K. And again, like the other videos, we'll tack one leg and then solder them all up later. RR2 is a 10K. RR1 is a 4.7K. RR4 is a 4.7K. That's all the resistor packs. They all face in the same direction. So just pay attention to the dots on the resistor packs themselves. And now we'll just solder the legs up on all the resistor packs. The next component is the crystal. And I'm going to raise the crystal off the board slightly. In the instructions it said to put some plastic underneath, but I didn't have anything. Now I'm going to just compare the height of the sockets and the capacitors to see which one I want to do next. And it looks like there's very little difference. So I'm, I decide to do the capacitors. So let's place all of the decoupling capacitors. 
notice that the parts recommended in the bill of materials are actually the right parts and the capacitors and the caps just drop in with no fuss. The remaining blue caps are 10 microfarad and I'm using non-polarized. It doesn't matter which way they go in even though there is a plus on the board. So I will just use the foam like before, flip it over, solder one leg, straighten them and then solder the last leg. They all look good now, so let's just finish the soldering of these capacitors. And save your leg, save the capacitor legs, they're really good for prototyping. That's all of the lower capacitors in. Now we'll just work our way through the sockets, picking them off the PCB where I laid them all out. We'll tag one corner down and then solder everything up at the end. The last socket is for the PLCC and you can see on the silk screen there is a corner that is chamfered and there's also the matching corner on the socket so you know which way to put it in. Before we solder them up we'll just do a quick visual check, make sure that all the sockets are in the right way and that they're flat to the board. So do any adjustments that you need to before soldering up all the rest of the legs. You might notice that one socket has got some pins missing. I didn't have the right size socket, so I just used a slightly bigger one and just pulled the actual pins out. Let the soldering commence. Now the sockets are in and soldered, we'll work our way through the remaining components and the first one is a PN222. I then do the dip switch on the corner. Next I'm going to do the headers for the jumpers and just cut them down to the size that we need to put them into the board. Next is the small speaker. We have a resettable polyfuse for the 5 volt. Next is the PS2 keyboard port. The 
The last two components left is a reset switch, which I don't have, and the adjustable capacitor. But I want to just do a quick more research just to check what I need to do with it before I solder it in. But that's pretty much all the soldering done, just these two last parts. So I, I did look on the GitHub page and I couldn't find anything that stood out to me telling me what I needed to do with this adjustable capacitor. So let's just put it in. We can worry about that later. There we are, that is everything assembled apart from the reset switch. Now let's give it a clean, just like before using the ultrasonic cleaning solution and then some IPA. Enjoy my nice farty compressor. Make sure you wear your anti-static before handling any integrated circuits. The first two chips to go in are the Alliance RAM. If you only have one of them, you're limited to 512k. I won't put the ROM in just yet because it needs programming. And same goes for the gal in the corner that we need to program to work with the dip switch to set the upper memory address base. So let's put the 74 series logic in. The first two chips are 74F 244. These run at 15 nanosecond gate switch time. The next two are 74F 245s. The next three are 74AS573. I wasn't able to get the F series and the AS I believe is within the tolerance that was specified on the bill of materials. Next we have the NEC V20 and when used with the, the revision A of the Faraday chip it will give us three possible speeds. Let's just put the pick, the ROM and the GAL to one side that we need to program just after this. If you look closely at the Faraday chip, you will see that one corner is also has the corner cut. It's not quite as big as the socket, but you'll still notice it. So I'm back after programming the three chips and while I was doing it, it was really straightforward, so I decided not to include it. I used the Mini Pro, it supports all these three chips. Just pick the right product, download, the, get the files downloaded, and away you go. Really straightforward. The only one that was a little bit tricky was the pick for the PS2 keyboard, and you have to get that from a different website. It was really straightforward, automatic registration, so there was no messing about, and I got it straight away. All the links will be in the description. Right, so let's put in the gal. Next we have the pick, which is for the PS2 keyboard interface. And the very last thing is the EEPROM, which contains the BIOS. And because this is an EEPROM, the actual BIOS configuration is stored within this, so there's no need for a battery backup. So the last parts now are jumpers and dip switches. And if we look on the instructions on the GitHub, JP3 it says to leave open if you're using U16. JP4 is also left open if you're using U16. So we don't need to do anything with those. So there you can see JP3 and JP4 in between the Faraday and the 74 logic. JP2 needs to be closed to allow us to use the maximum frequency of the NEC V20. The instructions for JP1 say to leave it, um, to leave it open as default, but for some reason I've decided to put a jumper on there. So that's something that I'll have to look into when I get back to the workshop. Now let's look at the dip switches and switch number two controls the graphics and the keyboard. 
I have the Trident VGA card, so we want 2.1 and 2.2 to be on, and I also leave switch 3 on. Looking at what I'm doing in the video, I also don't do anything with switch 3. I leave all of those off. Again, something that I'll just have to do a little bit more research. There we go, that is our board, which is now fully assembled. All of the chips are programmed. I've set up the switches, as far as I'm aware, and the jumpers, which I need to readdress. And we've cleaned the board. We're all set, really, now. And we can start to look at putting this computer together. This isn't an actual kit that I brought, so I didn't actually have instructions. However, the bill of materials and the way that the board is laid out on the silk screen made it really, really easy to build this kit. I had way much more fun building this than I did the sound card. Hated that sound card. Links to everything that you need to know will be in the description if you wanted to do this. Now that we've built these three kits, the next part will actually start to put it together and we'll do some testing. Thank you for watching these videos. I hope you've enjoyed them. I know that they're a little bit dry in, in some places, but we are going to be building a, an XT PC from parts that we've soldered ourselves. How cool is that? So I'll see you on the next video.